we have great pleasure in having a special event, very short notice, extraordinary response in a few days. Um, you're all here, so um, thank you for coming. We were expecting 20 or 30 and we had a tremendous response. And that's a lot to do with um, Alex Washburn, who I will briefly introduce. The order of the day's events will be uh, after my introduction, Alex will speak, and then um, maybe I'll assist in taking questions, and then uh, James Warwick, Professor James Warwick, will, will um, sum up and uh, thank our speakers. So, so there's time for questions, and there'll be a bit of uh, summing up. So um, you probably know Alex Washburn, but I'll, I'll mention a few things uh, by way of background. Um, probably the most interesting overview would be this exceptional uh, combination of, of uh, public and private presence uh, in his professional profile. Um, he's unique in maintaining excellence within financial and political requirements from a design perspective. That, that blend of finance, uh, politics and uh, design is a rare, rare blend indeed. He currently works for New York, New York's planning department as the chief urban designer for the city of New York and is also a principal of W Architecture and Landscape Architecture um, uh, for about 10 or more years. Um, he's won both local and national AIA design awards um, uh, as founding president of the Moynihan Pennsylvania St uh, Station Redevelopment Project, which he led from 1996 to 2000. He's previously served as Environment and Public Works Advisor to U US Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan and is the only architect on US Senate staff uh, responsible for planning issues under the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. He's taught uh, the Design of Infrastructure uh, course at Princeton University and is also at New York University Center for Advanced D Digital Applications. In 2002, he was made a National Resource Pro Professional at the Mayor's Institute of City Design and in 2003 became an architectural design critic for New York One Television. Uh, through his teaching, he's been appointed as an adjunct professor at the Centre for Advanced Digital Applications uh, at NYU, and he's also an adjunct professor at um, the Design of Infrastructure for, for the Design of Infrastructure at Princeton University. He's published, and that includes um, work on real estate, finance and development, as well as um, the Venice Biennale Transurbanisation. And his projects include the West Harlem Waterfront Park and Master Plan and a number of conversions, including the Rising Sun Mills conversion. Um, we really look forward to hearing uh, Alex and uh, in the audience. I know many of you are bridging both those roles, um, driving change in Sydney, and um, it's going to be a great, great hour. So, so thank you for coming. <laughs> Good day. Is that, all right, so it's a or good afternoon. So that's, so I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is really a thrill to be hosted by you all, and I thank you so much for, for putting this together at the, at the last minute. Um, speaking of minutes, my biological clock is about 14 hours behind you, so there's a slight time lag here. But, um, but the excitement <laughs> of, of being able to, to speak to, to you all and, um, is really f making me Quite, quite impassioned to be, to be here in this room, uh, in this city, which is really spectacular. And I want to thank James yesterday for having taken me around the city and shown me something of, um, of Sydney, which just continues to impress me at, at every turn. Before I begin, though, I, I'd, I'd like to understand you all a little bit better. Who, who here is a landscape architect? An architect? Anyone consider themselves financiers or in finance, money people? No, no. Even grant receivers? No? <laughs> OK. How about in politics? Are any of you involved as politicians or, in, or enjoy policy? OK. Good, good. Well, that's, that's good, to, good to understand. I, I'm an architect myself uh, by training, although I, I work um, as a chief urban designer in the Department of City Planning uh, in New York City. Um, I'm a designer, and um, I'll talk about this more as we go on, but I th believe it really is the act of designing that, that keeps us um, moving forward in, in whatever career path we're going. So 
it's good to know your, your backgrounds, but how many of you consider yourselves urban designers? Good, good, okay. Well, let's begin. All right. Oh, by the way, a brief blurb. The, what you'll hear today, these are actually my opinions, and for official New York City opinions, you have to go to our website. <laughs> okay, so after this brief disclaimer, let's go on. Okay, what is urban design? Urban design, I believe, is, a, is the tool that guides the change in cities. And it's important to understand that, that urban design does not design cities. It designs products that change cities. Okay? So rules, plans, um, pilot projects, discrete, actionable products that lead to change, but never the whole city itself. And just be careful of that definition, because otherwise you're often liable to fall into a tautology that either leads to a stultifying sameness or else a timidity in front of your city. And as urban designers, you are here to change things. If you like the status quo, you do not need an urban designer. Urban designers work at the intersection of politics, finance, and design. And someone can be an urban designer from any one of these professions. Uh, politics and finance typically are stronger than design. And even though design, I believe, is what, what drives us, I tell all my, my younger staff and the interns and fellows who come to work with us to understand that in this hierarchy, which you have to bring into alignment, the window for design opens only very, very briefly. And it's incumbent on you as an urban designer to know what you want to get accomplished and to be able to go through that opening when it's open and then realize it will come shut, politics and finance will continue, and design at that point will not have the leverage it did before. Also, it's good to know that you can be the world's greatest designer there are many great designers out there, but unless you can design while under the pressure of politics and under the demands of finance, you're not really an urban designer. Even though we operate at the scale of the city, in urban design, the smallest dimensions matter. The scale of a curb, the width of a tree pit, the clear path on a sidewalk are all critical dimensions. And the reason for that is that urban design, unlike architecture, operates simultaneously at many different scales. And part of your education as an urban designer is to understand how a certain idea that can operate fine at the scale of 10 meters will be the inverse at the scale of 100 meters or a kilometer. I think that's a problem that we had in the period of heroic modernism where you would simply scale up design ideas that might work beautifully in the Villa Savoy and expect them to work beautifully at the scale of Chandigar, and the answer is that they don't. They change as scale changes. And to learn that chain of scales, it's, it's very hard. I, don't, I wish I had a recipe or, or, a, or a facile rule for it, but the only way I know to understand that is to understand how people use a space, whether it's their own living room or a plaza or a city itself in their daily commute, and to look at precedents and basically to just keep looking around. Which brings me to a very important point. If a space is worth remembering, it's worth drawing. As urban designers, drawing is not only how we communicate, but it's how we read a space. I won't hire anyone who cannot draw by hand. And you know, I get wonderful, wonderful students and professionals coming from all over the world with the hottest portfolios, degrees from top universities in Tokyo and MIT, et cetera. And they show me the portfolio and I ask them, well, where are your hand drawings? And they say, well, I don't have them with me. So I say, all right, here's a pen, <laughs> draw. <laughs> Uh, and at first, it, it causes some consternation, but immediately, ev even the rusty, you start, it's a fluidity that's latent within us. If you're an urban designer, you have drawing inside of you. It's like reading for a writer. 
And when you go to a great space, you take the time to sit down and the time to start sketching it. And that act may not result in something worthy of a gallery, but it will result in that space going inside your head and hopefully inside your heart, and then being able to be transmitted to your colleagues and the stakeholders that you'll work with down the line. And finally, listening changes the city. This is a picture of my boss, Amanda Burden, Chair of City Planning in New York, with Michael Morella, the head of our Waterfront Division, at one of over 100 public meetings that they went through in developing our Vision 2020 plan for our waterfronts. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, but we're in an era where it's critical to engage with the public and to take the time to understand and listen. Listening builds respect, both from the point of view of those who are not in power, who wait their turn to speak, and those who are in power, who show the care to await everyone having a chance to have said what they have to say. Okay, I'm gonna give you a lightning fast urban design history of New York. And I'll begin with Manhattan. The last time New York City was sustainable, uh, as I like to point out to my Dutch friends, was before they arrived. <laughs> and we, we, know, um, we know a tremendous amount, actually, about the state of Manhattan before the uh, European arrival, thanks to the work of Dr. Eric Sanderson. Uh, he, uh, it's tremendous work if you happen to see it online or, um, or can get a copy of it, but the Manhattan Project, where he found a, uh, a British military map from the era of the Revolutionary War, which was extremely accurate and included all the topography of springs and brooks and all those things that might impede the workings of an army um, and recorded it. And he was able to georeference that onto modern maps of Manhattan and come up with a very accurate placement of the natural features of the island from 400 years ago. Um, and then using various tools of biology, including something called the Muir diagram, he was able to interpolate species relationships and understand that they were almost 200 neighborhoods of ecological neighborhoods back in the original Manhattan and was able to plot those out to their present places. And now if you go onto his website, you can click on your block, let's say, and see what it looked like. To see that Times Square used to be a black adder swamp. Um, to see that Greenwich Village had you know, a wonderful stream running through it. But I just say this to emphasize that every city has a topography and a nature beneath it. And it's very important to work with that nature and to understand it from the start. Now, New York entered the Industrial Revolution a little bit ahead of most other American cities. Back in 1811, the city fathers decided to expand in rivalry with Philadelphia, which was a gridded city uh, in Pennsylvania, about 100 miles away. These commissioners, three of them and a surveyor, did something very audacious. They threw a grid across the entirety of Manhattan. Manhattan at that time, New York, was simply the tip of the island. Wall Street was called Wall Street because it had a wall to keep marking the end of the city. Now that was slightly before in the Dutch time, but even by their time of 1811, it had hardly progressed beyond that first fat portion of the, of the tip. They proposed to throw a grid across the entire island, 11 miles, uh, in characteristic 200 foot wide by 800 foot blocks, avenues running north-south at 100 feet, cross streets at 60 feet. This was considered a little bit of, of craziness at the time because this was all farmland. Um, and however, they, they were very confident in their growth. They did, they did do one strange thing. The land, even though it was, even at that time, was very expensive. And they, they mentioned in their notes to the, the plan that there aren't any large green spaces provided in this commissioner's plan of 1811. And the reason being that, well, New York is fortunate to have two great arms of the sea, as they called them. 
the Hudson River and the East River, in dis as distinct from Paris or London, which have mere streams. You know? And they figured that, well, if anyone wanted light and air and recreation, they would simply go to this excellent long shoreline and experience um, that air there. Now, they unfortunately did not anticipate the application of the steam engine to shipping, which changed all that. And, and one of the people that changed it was Commodore Vanderbilt. He's the, uh, the, great, the first great tycoon of the, of the Americas, and he's the one who came up with that phrase, build it and they will come. And that phrase he was referring to a railway that he was putting along the west side of Manhattan um, in an area that his friends wondered why in the world he would think to invest in, in that kind of infrastructure. But he said, build it and they will, will come. I'm not sure, because he started his career as a ferryman. He was on Staten Island, and his business was to bring people back and forth. I wonder if he had a premonition about steam and shipping. But of course, the minute that steam was applied to commercial shipping, there was no longer any limitation to where you could dock on Manhattan. Before the strong tides in the Hudson River, whose Lenape name means river that flows both ways, prevented an easy tie up anywhere but the tip of the island. But once that change was made, Ships were docking all along the coast, and the area where he had put his railroad developed into an incredible industrial center. And the whole island started being choked with industry, and the coastline, which the commissioners had expected to be open for recreation, was closed off. It was privatized and industrialized. So in the middle of the 19th century, if you were a working man in Manhattan, and you wanted some peace and quiet, some place to go with your family on a Sunday afternoon, your best bet was a cemetery. So that brings me to my first great urban designer in New York City, and that's Frederick Law Olmsted, a landscape architect. I'm in awe both of his creativity and his design abilities in the design of Central Park, but also in his ability to get things done, to have Central Park achieved. In the reality of Central Park, in making that a reality, he democratized the society of New York. For the first time, there was a public space where the Astors could drive their carriages and the carpenters could picnic. It mixed every class, and it brought the city a sense of itself that it would lack without this public space. And to do that in the financial and political background of this money-crazy, industrialized typhoon of a city was something extraordinary. The fact of Central Park, I think, has a lot to do with the continued success of New York and when it became what's what we like to call the capital of the 20th century. And the 20th century, from an urban design point of view, started out very, very fortuitously, um, although it was because of a crime, an urban design crime. That crime was, in 1910, the Equitable Life Assurance Company owned a block near Wall Street, and to maximize its return on its land, and using the newest technology of skyscrapers, built its block straight up. Very handsome building. The building is around today. Unfortunately, its neighbors, also titans of Wall Street, realized that they had been robbed. This building, by going straight up, had taken their light and air. So in a situation that is un paralleled, even in our day, Wall Street asked for regulation. <laughs> and that regulation became in the form of the 1916 zoning resolution, which is a, a sketch of which is up here. I love, I love this form of zoning. It's, it's so simple. You take the width of your street, you can go up one to one and a half times, depending on the density of your district, straight up from the property line, but then you're required to angle back at an angle that has to do with the center line of the street. And then when you get to 25% of your lot, sky's the limit. No controls, do whatever you want. That zoning resulted in some of the world's greatest buildings. The Chrysler Building, for instance, is, is a product of that, of, that, 
of that zoning. I love it for its simplicity. I love it for the vigor of the buildings that it inspired. Um, and it worked well for the first half of the century. Which brings us to my next great New York urban designer, Robert Moses. Moses was the power broker. Are you all f I'm sure you all are familiar with, with him, but he began life as parks commissioner and <clears throat> never was elected to office, but managed to accumulate power in a, <laughs> in a very smart way. He never gave up his previous appointment when he took on a new one. So by, in, in the fullness of his career, he had a virtual bouquet of business cards and, uh, and commissioner's titles. But in, in reality, he became the most powerful man in, in New York City. I've, I've been told that there are echoes of him in your Dr. Bradfield. Um, a little bit. A little bit, okay. Well, Moses, um, in post-World War II New York, when, when he was reaching the apogee of his power, the demand for growth was tremendous. And his approach was to take blocks, consolidate them, demolish the fabric that was there, and build high-rise towers. And he would connect, he would build bridges, and he would build highways to those bridges, which were told. And he then generated an incredible set of cash flow for him, his own enterprise, and led to this ever-increasing highway and bridge building and demolition and block agglomeration. Um, it's interesting, my, um, I used to work for Senator Moynihan on, on Capitol Hill. And Senator Moynihan, when he was younger, worked for President Kennedy. And when he was even younger, used to work for Governor Harriman in the 50s when Moses was at his apogee. And he remembers, he, to, he told me, of being in meetings where Moses would enter the room for an audience with the governor and have a manila envelope, an empty envelope. And on that envelope were written in pencil the names of several projects. And he would hand that envelope to the governor, wait a moment, the governor would look at it and say, okay, and then that was it. That was the meeting. That was planning in New York City, the ultimate in top down. Well, Moses took, took this approach on um, and was very successful at it until he met the third great urban designer in New York, Jane Jacobs. Uh, Jane was a mother, she called herself a mother with big glasses, who lived in Greenwich Village um, on Hudson Street. And Moses had proposed to put a highway through Greenwich Village to connect the tunnels and a bridge um, and she organized a community group to oppose him. Um, much of the community building she did was in her favorite bar, the White Horse Tavern, which is still there on Hudson Street. And I recommend it highly as a stop if you, when you come to New York. Um, but she, she and Moses fought to a standstill. She succeeded in stopping Moses. She didn't completely derail him. He was still very powerful. Um, and much of our planning process is actually an echo of their struggle. It's interesting that in 1961, two parallel events happened that, that epitomized this. On the one hand, the 1961 zoning resolution was passed, which amended 1916 zoning to make as of right many of the planning principles that Moses had bowled through on his own. Um, tower in the park, height factor buildings, parking requirements, etc. Those, those were codified. On the other hand, it was also the year that Jane, with a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, published The Death and Life of Great American Cities. She talked about the ballet of Hudson Street. She gave lay people, not professional planners, an understanding of the meaning and importance of the fine grain of neighborhood life. And these two events, somehow history is always like that. They pair. And our planning process now, it took about 15 years to work it out. And in the meantime, we formed community boards. And there were all sorts of changes to the city's charter. But we've now ended up in something called the Uniform Land Use Review Process. It's a very cumbersome name. It's actually seven, it's got a seven-month clock. Um, and it, it's something worth studying uh, in any of your courses. But a project enters Euler and has top-down impetus to start, bottom-up input from the community boards as it goes along, and then a little more top-down impetus from the borough president, and then on and on in the sort of conga line as it moves through of top-down and bottom-up, 
and then exits the process eventually with a vote from the city council and then being signed into law by the mayor. I like to think of this as their legacy in, in planning and, and uh, legal terms as to how we approach large projects in New York today. Well, today our challenges for urban design are very different from those in the, the 20th century. And this is a storm track showing a hurricane crossing the Atlantic heading for the east coast of the United States. We have several things going on at once. Number one, we're growing. New York City is expecting a million more New Yorkers in the next generation. Now this is happening in the context of climate change and specifically sea level rise and hurricane tracking. Now, you know, the risk to New York of a hurricane strike is actually greater than the risk to New Orleans. Risk, you have to remember, is defined as probability times consequences. And though even though our probability is less than one hitting New Orleans, the consequences are far, far greater. In fact, last summer, we had a hurricane, Hurricane Irene, that actually had the doomsday track. It was tracking at exactly the angle that would have swept the winds that would funnel into New York Harbor. It was on the track that we feared most. One of my associates, Thad Pawlowski, who is a catastrophist. Self, there's actually a group in New York. They, they meet regularly. They're called regional catastrophists. He, um, he used to work at the Office of Emergency Management um, before coming to me. And he was on vacation in Brazil. And uh, literally, as his plane was touching down to vacation, he heard the news about the storm track. He got off the plane, got on another, and came back hoping to uh, <laughs> be at the center of the storm, such as it was. But thankfully for New York, that hurricane, the winds about 50 miles off the coast, turned into tropical storm level winds, and we were spared a big event. But it is very, very important to us. We do not want what happened to Orleans to happen to New York. So what we're after is some sort of livable sustainability. And this has many aspects to it. I'll talk about a few soon. But they range from everything from carbon counting to healthy zoning. Um, the city has to be both livable and sustainable. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. First, by introducing our overarching plan, which is called Plan YC. This is a program that Mayor Bloomberg instituted and in, announced in 2007 on Earth Day, 135 rather technical programs that would address these issues of climate change and how we were going to grow during this, this period. Now, the urban design agenda following Plan YC really can be broken down into three, three major issues. The first is how will we fit more people within our fixed political borders? And here is a map of where we intend to put the extra density. You'll notice that if you superimpose the subway map, it's the same thing. We are increasing density where there is public transit, and we are reducing density where there is not. So that will limit the number of new cars coming on the road while maximizing the potential of our 100-year-old subway system now as it gets improvements. It's called transit-oriented development. It's now commonplace around the world. But New York made a commitment to that 100 years ago, and it's renewed that commitment for another 100 years. The second part of the urban design agenda is sustainability, which is both mitigation to reduce carbon as well as adaptation to protect the city from the effects of climate change. So just a small illustration to show you where the carbon comes from in New York City. It's primarily our buildings. Buildings make up the, the lion's share of this. Um, it's, it's sort of a, not an issue when it comes to new buildings because they're all, I think you call it green star. Is that the, the, the term here? They're lead, lead gold, lead platinum certified in, in New York. So new buildings really aren't a problem. But in 2050, we've done surveys. And it turns out that 85% of the buildings that will be around in 2050 are already here today. So how do you get the economic, political incentives to renovate and upgrade your existing building stock becomes an important question for New York City, as well as a, an important theme of architecture. That could 
subject of another, another talk, but architecture is changing. The, the kind of Bilbao effect is less, less of an issue. And I think there is a new calling for architects to bit by bit improve what we have and return to a, to a frame of thought when architecture is a tool of building cities rather than a tool of getting famous. Okay. And finally on, on the urban design agenda, it doesn't matter how well we solve our technical goals of growth and sustainability, if we don't make the city more livable, if we don't improve the quality of civic life, we are not being urban designers. And in New York, we believe that to improve the quality of civic life, you improve the quality of public space. Public space is where society builds trust. It's where citizens can meet as equals. And this is a picture I'm very fond of. This is my daughter, Lelia, in Paley Park, entranced by the waterfall. And it has a generational meaning to me because Amanda Burden's stepfather built this park. And Amanda learned about planning by helping him on it. And the lessons she learned in the park that was built still enchants, whether it's children or visitors or just regular old New Yorkers, it still enchants today and is critical to the livability of New York. In all the realms of design, politics, finance, academia, you know, we all have our technical specialties, but I, I just find the simplest question to ask is how do we leave the city better than we found it? It's really the only mission statement you have as someone who works for the city or on the city. And it made me think when I was reading the, the fine print of Plan YC, and going through all the technical chapters, that it was echoing something larger and older, something called civic virtue. Uh, in the Oath of the Athenians, back in, in, in the age of Pericles, when an, when an Athenian came of age, he had to take an oath. And part of that oath was to leave the city not less but greater than he found it. And that was a notion of civic virtue, where you do something generationally, where you won't get the immediate benefits now, but you invest the political capital, the financial capital, the, the muscle to get something done now whose benefit you may not see, but your city will see. And the Greeks branded this notion of civic virtue. I don't think we, the Greeks invented it necessarily, but they branded it um, through classical architecture. And for a very long time, if you wanted to show that you were doing something good for your city, you would build a building with classical architecture. And this two and a half thousand years later, the federal government in New York City, 1913, wanted to give a gift to the city of a new post office. And to express this sort of civic virtue, how it wanted to do something good for the city, it ended up with a building that had the world's largest Corinthian colonnade. I mean, this is, this is two and a half thousand years after the Greeks. This is a very durable brand. Um, but unfortunately, I think the brand has been diluted, and I think we are now in a different era. And I, I think the acanthus leaf that led to the Corinthian column is now going back to a backpack full of lettuces. I think now if you want to do something good for your city, you express it through green networks. You express it through a park or through some infrastructure that will help us achieve these goals of livable sustainability. It's really a way of instilling values and values across generations. And I think that most important value is an understanding that the city and the environment are one. That the management of our success as a city is really correlated to the management of our success in the environment. And this is a picture of another daughter of mine, Athena, walking through the North Cove at Battery Park City. This is only about a half kilometer from Wall Street. And yet, it feels like you're in, in the loveliest forest glen. And that juxtaposition is, I think, the way forward for our cities. Now, getting back to some of the technical 
aspects. And as I've always tried to think how, how do these two, these notions of civic virtue intersect with the, with the technical. And, and I think it's actually relatively simple that, for instance, the, the, the technical goal of adaptation, making your city ready for the effects of climate change that have already occurred, is really a form of prudence. And I want to show you an example of that. In August 2008, we had a, a rainstorm. Not an exceptional amount of rain, but it was very brief. It all ha fell in less than an hour. And as a result, it overwhelmed our subway system. The stair here became a waterfall in Times Square. It shut down the subway. This is a huge event for New York. Seven million people a day ride the, the subway. Um, it, it caused incredible amounts of economic loss and, and otherwise. And after it happened, the, the governor uh, called up his transportation authority and said, I never, ever want this to happen again. And some research was done, and it turns out that the water that really shut things down was entering primarily through these grates. And the engineers calculated that if we raise the grates by a few inches in certain places, we'll be able to delay the water long enough so that the regular storm sewers, the regular sewers can take it away before it fell into the subway system. So a brief was developed and given to an Grimshaw Architects, and they came up with this solution. Now, I like this solution because it raised the grates. It solved the technical problem. But it also gave you a beautiful place to sit and a very nice place to attach your bike. So it improved the quality of public space while solving a technical problem. It improved our civic life while solving a technical problem. So at a very, very fine grain and small scale, this to me is an excellent example of livable sustainability in urban design and infrastructure. At the other end of the scale, thinking about that hurricane again, this is a map of the bathymetry of New York Harbor. What happens in a hurricane is that there's something called a storm surge, where the circulating wind of the storm pushes a wall of water. And it, that wall of water is funneled through the narrows and gains velocity and enters upper New York Harbor, where it's aimed at the tip of Manhattan and, and regions of Brooklyn and Staten Island. And as a way to counter that velocity, an engineer at Princeton, Guy Nordenson, came up with an idea along with ARO, the architecture firm, of building a series of offshore reefs or islands um, that would act like a washboard, that would take the horizontal velocity out of that storm surge and make the force of its impact much, much less substantial. So yes, you would get flooding, but it would be like a bathtub flooding. And yes, things would be wet for a few days, but then it would drain since, since this is above sea level. Um, what I like about it is that it's made for a one in a hundred year storm event, maybe one in 500 years. But if it is one in a hundred, yes, it has to work on that one. But what about the other 99% of the time? And in that sense, it becomes a wonderful chain of parks offshore. For 99% of the time, it's a wonderful public space asset to the city. So at a very large scale, this is also to be an example of livable sustainability solving a technical problem, but improving the quality of civic life at the same time. Now, of course, this is just a thought. Uh, it's a project. Who knows how much it would cost or whether it would be feasible in different ways. But it's the way that some of the best minds are thinking now in New York. Flip side of sustainability is mitigation, which I'm sure you all are familiar with in some of your technical courses, the idea of reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and therefore slowing down the effects of future climate change. Um, I see this as really very little more beyond the idea of the virtue of thrift, a very common human virtue. And typically, you know, when we want to address um, mitigation, we'll do extra insulation, change to fluorescent light bulbs. But New York has a slight twist on that. New York's greatest measure of mitigation is the fact that people walk. Remember we were looking at the carbon bubbles of where all the, the carbon came from and it was primarily from buildings? Well, the reason that's primarily from buildings and not from transportation as it is in most other parts of the world, including Australia, is that our subway system only puts out 1.4% of all this carbon because it's so efficient. 
And the reason the subway works is that once you get out of the subway, your last hundred meters, your last couple hundred meters is a walk. And a walk in New York is a very fabulous thing. Walking has several other benefits, which we're now beginning to explore from a health perspective. And that could be, love to talk more about that at, at another time, but um, walking is integral to the, the city's life. And people sing about it. <laughs> I find, you know, like when I try to tell people what my job is, well, part of my job, I guess, is to make streets worth singing about. And you know, whether it's Frank Sinatra or Jay-Z or Alicia Keys or even the numbers of 19th century, people write songs about walking down the street in New York, and for very, very good, good reason. Um, the word pedestrian in the dictionary typically means dull, but in New York it means the opposite. It's fabulous. It's incredible to walk down New York, both Fifth Avenue at twilight, past Rockefeller Center, of course, it's fabulous, but also Saturday morning on Jackson Avenue in Queens, past the incredible ethnic grocers and the restaurants and the people. It's public space is the street in New York. And it's where we are all equal and where we meet each other. Now, it doesn't just happen by chance. Real estate is real estate. And the street is defined as the area between the property lines. And in that finite right of way, many practical functions have to take place, whether it's bus lanes, clear paths for sidewalks, tree pits, bike lanes, parking lanes. There is more than can fit in any given right of way. So part of my job is to figure out a system or a hierarchy that lets us know what is more important than what else and what gets first precedence. And you do that by superimposing these functions in the space you have and making, making choices. But to make those choices means that you have to have a value system. And in New York, we really do believe that the pedestrians come first. And then we like to help bicycles, and of course cars as well come in after that. They, they're not, never excluded, and I think that's an important point. We're very wary in New York of actually removing cars. Cars are integral to how the city functions. But they have capabilities. They have engines. They, they can go around the block. They don't necessarily need the curb cut to the garage to be in next to the front door. It could be by the side. It's just a chain of decisions that you make that eventually balance a street. And here's an example of a street we designed that's now being built in Hunters Point, Queens, where you have park, waterfront parkway, bicycle lanes, sidewalk, tree pits and planting strips, a sober amount of carriageway, more tree pits, bus lanes, and then a clear path for the sidewalk before the retail of the building. And to try to balance that hierarchy by always judging from the point of view of the pedestrian. And I want to digress a moment and emphasize this, maybe give another example. It's not a simplistic thing to judge from the point of view of a citizen walking down the street. Uh, it's no more simplistic than Apple judging how easy the iPhone is to use with your finger. It's an interface. So the most complex rail infrastructure that we have to devise, the most complex cogen, doesn't matter. Still ask, what is it like to walk past it as a citizen, to use it as a pedestrian? Okay. The final category in our livable sustainability trilogy is resource generation. This is where you make something out of nothing. Substitute, for instance, you can make substitute wind energy from a renewable resource to offset a carbon burning power plant. It's where you can make land somehow in a city who's got a fixed political border. Well, we haven't quite gotten to uh, the Statue of Liberty solution yet, but we have done the other. Now that is the High Line. The High Line project, which I, I, you probably have heard about, and I hope, has anyone here actually visited it? Excellent. Okay. So it makes my job much easier here. It speaks for itself. Um, the High Line was an elevated railway line. Remember Vanderbilt having built his, his line down the west side of Manhattan? 
Well, he built it on the ground. And yes, it was very successful, but it was built along 10th Avenue. Uh, it changed the name of 10th Avenue to Death Avenue because the train kept running people over. So as part of a stimulus and improvement project in the 30s, um, partially funded by Moses, an effort was made to elevate this rail line into a four-track system up 20 feet in the air, build a series of incredible warehouses where the trains went through and in. Incredible infrastructure project and totally helped the safety of the streets. Unfortunately, it barely lasted 50 years. Perhaps as the uh, commissioners hadn't anticipated the steam engine, perhaps the 1930s rail planners hadn't anticipated trucking, the interstate system, the development of air freight, but of course, all these pressures plus labor issues and costs, industry left Manhattan. And the last industrial train here carrying a load of frozen turkeys ran down the rails in 1984. And after that, it was just left fallow. Of course, it was built like you wouldn't believe, so <laughs> it didn't go anywhere. Um, it just was an oddity in the neighborhood, except that it is built on land that's owned. And the people who own that land underneath it wanted to be able to build a building on their land and not have it encumbered by this disused railway. So they lobbied the mayor to tear it down. And at a community meeting, to discuss tearing it down, two regular guys, Joshua David and Robert Hammond, not architects, not uh, Josh the travel writer, they met, uh, sat next to each other at this community meeting, remember part of the bottom-up planning process, and they said they didn't know what should happen to this high line, but that it should not be torn down, or at least not now, without some thought. So they formed a group called the Friends of the High Line, and the Friends of the High Line began to organize, um, gain, gain members. And one of those members was Amanda Burden. Um, when Mayor Bloomberg won the election, he appointed Amanda Chair of City Planning. And with this result, now the High Line could benefit from the planning department's tools. And Amanda, working with the deputy mayor, Doktoroff, under instructions from Mayor Bloomberg, used or ordered that the tools of zoning be applied towards saving the high line. But this is very important in, in urban design. Ur remember, urban design is about transformation. So it wasn't just about saving the High Line. It was what would the High Line's effect on the neighborhood around it be, and what would the neighborhood around its effect on the High Line be? So these were the official goals of, of this action, to transform the High Line into a unique linear park, but also to provide housing, both market rate and affordable, in a city that has a, a structural deficit of housing. Also to preserve the character of this neighborhood. While for the many years uh, between the last frozen turkey and the demolition order, a gallery district had grown in Chelsea in the manufacturing zone that was there. Very successful, some of the wonderful galleries. We didn't want to disturb that. Instead, we wanted to encourage a, a dynamic mix of land uses. What was just once manufacturing should also have retail and residential. Um, and when we, if we were to succeed, we wanted to make sure that the form of the buildings, the new buildings that would come up, would augment the new linear park and not detract or occlude it. So the first step was to decide on a special district. This is the existing zoning within the boundary of what became the West Chelsea Special District. We added new residential uses to the perimeter, maintained the manufacturing in the center where the galleries were, and then used a technique of zoning that was first used in an effort to save Grand Central Station, which was going to be torn down. Um, it's called air rights transfer. And that was a, an ability to take what could have been built where something important is 
to move it. Um, this was something that had proven itself all the way up to the US Supreme Court, so we knew that it worked. And so we declared a transfer district around the High Line and then mapped some very specific zoning districts which have very specific issues of height, bulk, land use, et cetera, into the sort of mosaic of uh, zoning within the district. Here's how the transfer works. Okay, these are those receiving sites at the perimeter of the special district. There's the High Line with a 100 foot wide transfer corridor. That becomes a granting site. Those five stories you could have built there could now be sold to receiving sites at the perimeter and built at the perimeter. And then to encourage affordable housing, we gave another bonus, uh, which allowed you to build a little bit more if you made a certain portion of the apartments affordable um, into the future. The staff at the department worked very hard to understand, OK, what in the fine grain, what is the relation of these new buildings to the High Line? They, used, they, they drew by hand to see would it be better for the High Line to touch the buildings, to have a space? Is it better to have galleries here, apartments here? To try to understand these issues from a very, very fine-grained point of view, and then to begin codifying them into what's called a bulk envelope. And a, a bulk envelope is written into the law um, through various equations and otherwise that eventually can turn into through parametric design or through just good old human brains and, and pencils, um, turns into geometric forms that um, include ratios of openness. Uh, for instance, in this one, 20% of the lot area has to be landscaped as open space and located up to a height no higher than the high line, with one side adjacent to the high line. We tried to figure that out for different types of buildings that would touch or be next to the high line. And the end result was to come up with a bulk envelope that would cradle the high line that would provide it light and air, views from, views to, and help hopefully be a, an improved frame as opposed to something that would occlude it. So overall, this is the, the district before, and this is the bulk proposed around the perimeter. And I want to give a very specific example of how this transfer worked between two buildings. Um, there are buildings by excellent architects, uh, Neil Denari on the High Line 23 building at 23rd Street, and Jean Nouvel, uh, at his building on 11th Avenue. So this is a picture of Neil's building next to the completed High Line. The box you see here is what perhaps would have been built had the High Line been torn down. Instead, that was built here at the top of Jean's building, which is right next to a Gary building on 11th Avenue. The way that worked is the block that was owned by the developer had a certain area. Had the High Line been torn down, you could have built your little five-story warehouse, end of story. But because the High Line was preserved, you took that square footage, you squeezed as much as could be built next to it into the building that Neil designed, and then there was a remainder, and that remainder was then transferred via this very elaborate process between Department of Buildings, City Planning, involving land use lawyers and accounting, and it, it works. It's, it's, it's complicated, but it, it works because you have to keep track of it. That was transferred over to the Jean Nouvel site. <clears throat> and I think in something that, that helped fuel the, um, the success of this whole process, every economic interest along the way was incentivized. So these five stories, yes, they would have been worth quite a bit had they been built if the High Line were demolished. But because of the presence of the High Line, they're worth even more. But because they were then transferred to the top of a building rather than being at the bottom of a building, they're worth yet again even more. So this increasing chain of value leads to the Jean Nouvel building being built, the Neil Denari building being built, and the High Line Park being completed. I, I like to ask myself, all right, well, what would my three great urban designers think of all this? And um, I think Moses would be quite impressed by the numbers. You know, 3.6 million square feet of building has gone on, $2 billion with only a private money, with only about 100 million of public. Um, two and a, more than 2,500 apartments have been built, 12,000 jobs have been created. Moses would have liked that, but he would never have believed that two community guys could have started something <laughs> this big. Okay. What have, would Jane have thought? I, I think. Um, 
she would have liked the fine grain that we achieved. She would have liked the character of the neighborhood, um, how lively it is, how people are enjoying themselves as they walk down the street. There's a, there's a certain ballet um, that goes on now in the, in the West Chelsea district. As much as she may have liked it, though, I think she would have been extremely suspicious and quite doubtful that government would ever have been able to write regulations that would have been fine-grained enough and supple enough to result in this character. And then finally, Olmsted. I think Olmsted would have loved this, you know, it's to have a ramble right down a portion of Manhattan, uh, right through nature. He would, he would have enjoyed this tremendously. However, he would have thought us crazy for building it 20 feet in the air. And that really brings me to what I have to look for in, the, in what we do every day in, in New York. And it, it's a lesson that I, I finally realized that you, you can't succeed in New York now unless you satisfy all three of these great urban designers. In, in any new project, you've, you've got to strive for the quantity of Moses, the quality of Jacobs, and the nature of Olmsted. And I see bringing those three together as the way of building livable sustainability in 21st century New York. And with that, I thank you and hope you <laughs> 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 <laughs>